And good morning, men. It's going to be a great day. <clears throat> How many of you guys are like really into cars? <clears throat> Car nuts, you know. Two or four wheels, I guess. Uh, actually, car nut, you'd probably have to have uh, four wheels to be a car nut, right? Well, uh, I've always loved cars. I, I can remember, and probably a lot of you guys in the room can remember too. I used to be able to pick out the make, the model, and the year in the rear view mirror at night of any car on the road. Some of you guys were like that, right? You remember that? Remember those days? Those were good days, weren't they? Of course, I, I haven't tried that lately. <laughs> My wife, on the other hand, <clears throat> is not really that into cars. A couple weeks ago, my wife took a car to the car wash. She has a silver Honda Accord. That's her car of choice. She loves her car. She took her car to a car wash and bumped into a friend and got to talking and wasn't paying much attention, but the car came out. She went over, got in the car. Guy ran over and said, hey, lady, what are you doing? That's not your car. She got into a silver Mercedes. Am I a lucky guy or what? <laughs> she is so not in the car, she doesn't even know the difference between a Honda and a Mercedes. Oh my gosh. Well, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about something related. We're going to talk about the subject of uh, how to talk about Jesus without sounding like a nut. Now, how many of you have somebody that you would, you would really like to share Jesus Christ with at this time. Some of you know right now that you would, yeah. And, uh, and uh, some of you can do that with confidence. Some of you can do it uh, and do it without confidence. Some of you, though, probably don't do it because you don't want to sound like a nut and you don't really know how to go about it. So this morning, we're going to just review, or you've heard this before, but all of you, whether you do it or not, we are going to review some ideas about how to share our faith by looking at how Jesus shared his faith, or one example of how Jesus shared his faith. And so uh, we're going to be looking at John chapter 4. We'll start at verse 5. And so we're going to be talking about how you can engage people in a, in a relevant way. Let me go ahead and give you the big idea. A nut is someone who smothers you with information on a subject of little interest in a language you cannot understand. That's what a nut is. A nut is, is someone who, who smothers you with information on a subject of little interest in a language you can't understand. And so, we all have had religious nuts kind of just hover over us. I remember at the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament. Now, I'm a Christian. I'm there with Tom Skinner, who's like the Christian of Christians. I mean, he's a, an evangelist who's preached all over the world, literally millions of people. And so, he and I are walking over the bridge to the U.S. Open, over the trains. And there's a guy there with a banner, a religious nut, really, there with a banner. It says, you know, repent, uh, this, this kind of stuff. And uh, now you may not think that's nutty. I, I think it's pretty nutty. But I remember him, I wouldn't say engaging me, I would say assaulting me or smothering me just presuming that, that I didn't have a clue about what he's talking about. And frankly, he was, well, he might have been, he might have been better off in a hospital anyway. Anyway, um, and that is someone who smothers you with information on a subject of little interest 
with, in a language you can't understand. Now, here's the layout for today. We're going to talk about three steps that we, we see in Jesus. The first is, is establishing rapport, finding a, a good starting point. Second is establishing relevance. Step two is relevance, answering questions that men are asking. And then the third is to, to recommend, uh, not really to argue about religion, but do recommend Jesus Christ. Okay, you'll pick up the, these as we go. First is, is rapport, finding the right starting point. Let's take a look at the text. John chapter 4. Did I say verse 4? I just changed my mind. Uh, actually, <laughs> that's as opposed to admitting that I made a mistake. Um, <laughs> verse 4. <laughs> Jesus had to go through Samaria on his way to Galilee. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Gosh, that's really would be interesting to have that much historicity and to be in touch with those kinds of things, wouldn't it? I don't know about Jacob's well, but I do know that there's a, there is a place down in the, in the Negev where there is a well at Beersheba, that very likely, you, who, who would ever know, but it, it really could be Abra, Abraham's well. And, you, and so I dropped a rock down in that and heard it go a long way down and then, then splash. And to think that that could actually be, could have been Abraham's well. And, and for this, this is just an amazing thing for Jesus to be able to, well, just for us to even be able to, to, to listen to this. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. So, Jesus is fully God, yes, and he is fully human, yes. Okay, so we see some of his humanity here, and then later, fully God. And it's noon. All right, verse 7, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Now, why did a Samaritan woman come to draw water at noon? Why would a woman come by herself in the heat of the day to draw the water? We'll find out here in just a moment, but that's a little foreshadowing. Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at that time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food at McDonald's. Well, verse 9. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. Now, Samaritans are Israelites, but they don't, they don't uh, honor all the same uh, ritual stuff. And so there's actually legislation at the time that a, a Jew is not to even eat with or associate with a Samaritan. There's, it's, it's like I was trying to think about it because it's it's uh, it's a type of high hostility that probably most of us don't know. Maybe some of our forebears knew, but the best I could come up with is kind of like the Yankees and the Confederates. Okay, they just hate each other, and so the woman was surprised. For Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. Yankees have nothing to do with with rebels. She said to him, "You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman." Not only a Samaritan, but a woman. There's also a tremendous prejudice against women in the day. So why are you asking me for a drink? Now, the amazing thing here is, is that Jesus is... Uh, um, may I have a drink? Let me, may I? Okay. Uh, now, for me to drink out of this cup that belongs to him... Um, to share the cup, I mean, I don't know what kind of diseases you have. I mean, you know. And I already know that you don't wash your hands. <laughs> it was a very interesting thing. What Jesus has done here is he has taken a rapport step. He, he, he knew that the woman had come for water so he decided to talk to her about water. In, in establishing rapport with someone, it's all about picking a subject in which they're interested. 
she was coming for water, so he talked to her about water. And he also surprised her a little bit because, first of all, he was talking to a woman. Second of all, he was talking to a Samaritan woman. And third of all, he was asking a Samaritan woman for a drink. That he was actually going to drink out of her vessel. That's really the very astonishing thing that's taking place here. I <clears throat> had a neighbor, a young guy who moved in next door to me with his living girlfriend. About a month later, I saw him down at the dock. He was despondent. So I said, you know, what's going on? He said, well, I can't find work. I love sports management. And so I thought I would take a rapport step with him. I said, well, see that house right over there across the lake? He said, yeah. He said, that, that's Pat Williams, who at the time was like the general manager of the Orlando Magic. And I said, and, and I know him. And I said, if you'd, you'd like, I would, I would be happy to get your resume to Pat and see if there would be any, any interest. Well, he brightened up enormously. Now, he didn't get the job. But by taking the rapport step, by finding a subject that, that he was interested in, we did establish a relationship. And later, he did give his life to Christ. And he did marry his living girlfriend and made her an honest woman. Made him an honest man, too. And so it, it worked out. It, this, is the, this, is the way, this is the way it's done. So if people want to talk about water, talk about water. If they want to talk about jobs, talk about jobs. If they want to talk about racing or cars, talk about cars. Whatever it is, if they want to talk about books, talk about books. Want to talk about business deals, then great. The idea in rapport is, is to find, do find a subject in which you share a common interest. Just very simple. If you know where you want to end up, any starting point will do. You see? It doesn't make any difference. In, in establishing rapport with, with somebody, talk to them about the Lord. You can, it doesn't make any difference where you start. If you know where you want to end up, if you want to end up at the foot of the cross, if you know where you want to end up, you can start anywhere you want. So you don't have to force this. You can let, let, let the situation develop. <clears throat> Again, the big idea is that a nut is someone <clears throat> who smothers you with information on a subject of little interest in a language you can't understand. So the idea here is, uh, first thing in establishing reports, find, find a subject where there's some mutual interest. Okay? Now, <clears throat> second is this relevance, answering questions that, that men are actually asking. Let's continue on in our text. So, in verse 9, it was noticed that Jesus has taken the rapport step, and, and rapport has been established, and now she says, she says in verse 9, the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. And then she asks a question. Why are you asking me for a drink? Why are you asking me for a drink? So now Jesus has a question that she's asked that he can answer and begin to establish some relevance. He replied, if only you knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. She wanted to, she came for water, wanted to talk about water. I would give you living water. Now, this is the first time Jesus has talked like this. He gets a lot bolder at the, uh, at the big pass. I guess it's the big Passover week at the beginning <clears throat> of his uh, Passion Week. You remember, he stands and announces to the crowd in John 7 that he would give living water to anyone who invited him to come in. He said that to the whole crowd. But at this time, <clears throat> in verse 11, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. 
Now she asks more questions. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think that you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? She's full of questions now, isn't she? So Jesus engages her with the questions that she wants to have answered. He replies, verse 13, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. <clears throat> Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here anymore. Well, she hasn't yet understood what he's saying, but he has engaged her answering questions that she's asking in a very relevant way, using the, using the rapport step, the starting point, the common ground, and then now he's just beginning to lead her, any starting point will do, and just gently leading her to where he wants to take her. So she says, you know, let me have this water, and then I don't want it to come here anymore. And then in verse 16, Jesus says, go and get your husband. Go and get your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. So what kind of a woman is this? Now you can see even more why, why she's so surprised that Jesus would say, give me, give me a drink. Now you know why she's coming at noon without the other women. She was an outcast among outcasts. And then in verse 19, Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me. Now she has more questions. Why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? While we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped. So now she's, it's interesting. So Jesus has sort of inched her along from water to spiritual things. You see how this is kind of unfolding here? This is beautiful. So she has actually asked him now a spiritual question. And so, so Jesus gives his reply. And then in verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Reinhold Niebuhr, <clears throat> in the uh, early 20th century, uh, wrote a book on the doctrine of man. Uh, he's a theologian. And he noted that in cultures where people are not looking for a Messiah, they're not asking any questions for which Jesus is the answer. This was a culture in which people were looking for a Messiah. You and I have the advantage that we actually live in a culture that is rich in Christian tradition, where people are thinking about salvation, needing salvation, or maybe they're thinking about, I don't need salvation, but they're thinking about the, the subject. There is an interest in the subject. And that is somebody who smothers you with information on a subject of little interest. That's really not the case in our culture. And that was not the case here in this culture. And so, in this relevance step, do speak in a language that people can understand. Notice how Jesus was speaking to her in terms of her own interests. Um, you can adjust the language based on your audience. When Peter spoke to the Jews, he said, Repent! Turn from your sins! And they responded. When Paul spoke to the Athenians... He said, you know, you have, a, you have a, a description over here to an unknown God. I'd like to tell you about that unknown God, who that was. They're doing the same thing, but they're speaking in a language people can understand. And that's what Jesus is doing here. And, of course, that's what we want to do if we don't want to sound like a nut. Because a nut is somebody 
who will smother you with information on a subject of little or no interest in a language you really can't understand what they're saying. And then the third piece of this is to, to recommend. Don't argue religion. Do recommend Christ. So what does Jesus do? He, she's asked this religious question so he could argue with her about all of that, you know, if he wanted to. And probably win the argument, I would think. Actually, you know, it's interesting because he's given us free will. He might win the argument, but still lose the, you know, lose, lose the, uh, win the, win the battle, lose the war. So she said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. I am the one of whom you speak. Interesting. It says, just then his disciples came back. Number one with regular Coke. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. And that because of this bias against women. But nobody had the nerve to ask him, you know, what's going on. Verse 28. The, that it says the woman left her jar, water jar, beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Now here are his disciples. Uh, they go to the village and they come back with food. Here's this Samaritan woman who he's now engaged. And uh, she goes to the village and, and she brings back the whole village. What this passage is really about is, is the evangelization of an entire city taking place through, really, if you think about it, a woman who has now become his disciple over against the failure of his real disciples, his, his closest followers, not getting anybody to come. So it's a great lesson for them. It's a great lesson for us is that a lot of times it's not sending, sending um, the most talented people the paid professionals. It, it's, it's finding somebody who's broken, who needs mending, who is passionate about receiving the answer, and then wants to drag all of their friends into the deal with them. Verse 39, Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. She recommended Jesus. She, she didn't argue about religion. Jesus did argue about with religion to her. He just recommended himself. And then she didn't argue about religion with... She just said, come and see. You know, it's the same words Jesus uses. She said, come and see. Here, here's somebody that told me about everything I've ever done. She, rec she just simply recommended Jesus. And they came and they believed. And so, don't smother people with religion. Simply recommend Jesus. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Let me pull it all together for you. So, I'm over at a garden center, my favorite garden center. And it's kind of a warm day, and I'm wearing a warm-up suit. So, the 25-year-old woman who was waiting on me, she said, I bet you're pretty warm in that suit. She wanted to talk about weather, so I took the rapport step and said, well, okay, we'll talk about weather. I said, yeah, it is actually, I am pretty warm. But, you know, you're out in the heat all day long. I bet you get pretty hot doing this job, don't you? She said, oh, you don't know the half of it. I just got back from Vermont, and I'm having a really hard time getting adjusted to the, to the Florida weather. Okay, so we've taken a little step. So I, 
I said to her, I said, oh, well, what were you doing in Vermont? She said, well, I went there to see if I could find myself. And I said, well, okay. So I'm, I'm thinking this is working pretty good. So I said, well, how'd you do? She says, well, to be honest, I'm a little confused. My father is from India. My mother is a nominal Catholic. And my brother is a Baptist who keeps telling me I'm going to go to hell if I don't receive Jesus. <laughs> Frankly, I think that all religions have merit and that there are lots of ways to find God. What do you think? So, we moved from rapport, and now we're getting into some, some relevance here. And so I said, well, you're probably asking the wrong person. She says, well, why is that? I said, well, you see, I'm what you might call a born-again Christian. I have put my faith in Jesus Christ to forgive my sins and uh, give me the, the gift of, e of eternal life. But, you know, about your brother... He shouldn't talk to you like that. He really sounds like a nut. <laughs> said, uh, on this comparative religion thing, I have a couple of thoughts for you, though, if you're interested. She said, I'd, yeah, I'd be very interested. I said, well, number one, if you go to the tomb of Confucius, occupied... If you go to the tomb of Buddha, occupied. If you go to the tomb of Muhammad, occupied. If you go to the tomb of Jesus, empty. I find that very intriguing, Amy, and I really frankly think you might want to think about that some too. Jesus is, as it turns out, the only of those men who cl actually claim to be God. I find that very interesting. And I think you probably owe it to yourself to just investigate whether or not you believe that's true or not, too. She says, huh. I said, and then I have a second suggestion. She said, what's that? I said, do you have a Bible? Oh, she said, oh, yeah, I've got a big black Bible my brother gave me. <laughs> I said, you mean the nut? She said, yeah. I said, well, what I would recommend you do is, is, is that, that you just, there, there's a small book in, in the New Testament part of the Bible in the back, towards the back. It's called John. And there are 21 chapters in the book of John. What, what I would suggest you do is find out for yourself. Why not read one chapter a day for 21 days, and then maybe it be, it, before you get started, just sort of pray, say, say something like, Jesus, if you really are God, then I pray that you would reveal yourself to me in these pages. And then I said, frankly, Amy, if he doesn't reveal himself... I don't know what I could possibly say to, to add. She says, you know, I think I'll do that. The big idea. A nut is someone who's going to smother you with information on a subject that you have little interest in or none in a language you can't understand. If you think about the person or persons that you would like to talk to about Jesus, just think about taking a rapport step with them, subjecting some, some, some common ground, and then just ask them questions that they're interested in, answer questions, ask them questions uh, of their interest, and then uh, eventually, uh, because you... If you know where you're going, any starting point will get you there. 
You just keep steering your answers and your questions in the direction and just take that person as far as they want to go toward Jesus. And then when you have the opportunity, recommend the Messiah. It's just, it's a beautiful thing. Yes? Well, what if somebody still thinks you're a nut? Well, that's okay, too. Because you already know that half of the people in the world aren't going to like you no matter what you do. So at least they might as well like you for the right, you know, if they're not going to like you, they may, may as well not like you for the right reason. Make sense? It's okay to be a nut if it's for the right reason. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, we're trying to hang out with you and just uh, know more about your identity, your purpose, your heart, your passions, your truth, your character, your desires, and how we can connect more to you. So each week I pray that you would help us to, to do that as we, as we come here and hang out. And I pray that for those men who this week will uh, actually have an opportunity to share their faith, that um, that you would give them great success. That that every person would come closer to Christ, and that many would come to Christ for your glory and your praise. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.